Hi everyone, uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm Simran and I am with Canopy. Canopy is a co-working space based in San Francisco. I'll add the link to our, um, to our little website in the chat box so you can check us out. And those that are Canopy members, thanks for joining. Um, so we are gonna be having a really fun chat with Julia De, De Morenas, um, who is part of the National Geographic Explore Society. Um, and she'll be talking about all of her research on searching for life in the universe and how to inspire the next generation. Uh, so I'll let you take it from here, Julia. All right, hi everyone. Thanks so much for joining us um, on your shelter in place. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. All right, is that coming through? I can't hear anyone, so I'm yeah, going to assume that's perfect. It, it looks great. Okay. All right. So I'm gonna, today I'm going to be talking about searching for life in the universe. And at the end, if there's time, I'm going to be talking about some of my work um, trying to inspire the next generation of explorers. So I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of my affiliations. I'm a National Geographic Explorer, uh, 2018 National Geographic Grosvenor Teacher Fellow. Um, and more recently, part of the California Explorer chapter leadership um, with a few other people who, some of them are in the room. Um, I see Kathy in there. Um, and, oops, let's see. Okay, so some of my other affiliations, I'm a part of the Blue Marble Space um, organization and nonprofit. I'm an American Geophysical Union um, Advocate for Science Fellow, and I do some fun space outreach events uh, called Space In Your Face, which is what the little astronaut logo is. So that's kind of all about um, what I wanna talk about my background. Um, I'll be talking about my work with Berkeley SETI Research Center in just a second. And um, so what I do for my day job, in addition, into looking for life out there. Um, I'm a, a SETI researcher by day, um, which means I, I use large radio telescopes to listen for signs of extraterrestrial technology. But some of my, my personal research is leading a project called the Moon Bounce Project. So what that means is we're lo listening or looking for what Earth sounds like to a distant observer. So, you know, the SETI is the search for life out there. And what we, you know, we're looking for other signs of, of alien technology, but what do we sound like to an alien? So that's the, the question I'm trying to answer. And we're doing this by using the moon um, to, as a natural reflector of radio light um, being bounced back at earth. And we're trying to capture the, the waves that we emit. We're trying to capture its reflection, if that makes sense. So here's how, here's a better scheme of how that works. So we have the Earth here, and we emit radio waves that propagate through space. They're going to, some of them will hit the moon and then bounce back into our receivers. And we want to kind of capture that to see what we sound like and how that's changed over time. This is a follow-up project to a project that has been go going on um, that was uh, done in the late 70s. So that's my project, that's what I work on. And today I'm hoping to blow your minds about how we detect life in the universe because it's a multifaceted endeavor uh, reaching all kind of scales of science, biology, astronomy, geology, um, even philosophy and some societal uh, like humanities topics. So before we begin, I'm going to um, open up the question, I would just kind of want to gauge where you all are at. How do we detect life out there? What do you think? What do you know? If you want to uh, type it in the chat box, just to make sure I'm not going to um, lecture you like little kids and you already know all this stuff. So I just want to gauge where you're at um, before moving on. So I can't see the ch if anyone's typing in the chat box. Yes, yeah, so we do. So one, there's a few things that have come through. One of them is water. Oh, awesome. Oh, here. I see the chat now. Okay. Are you seeing them? 
Narrow bandwidth signals. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. So we have some experts in here. They should be, they should be giving this lecture. <laughs> Great. Satellites with radio waves, narrow bandwidth signals, and water under the ice on Europa. A plus to all of you. If I were able to give you a gold star, I would do that. Okay, great. So what is astrobiology? Um, I would consider myself an astrobiologist and that's because I uh, do my research in the light of searching for life in the universe. NASA defines it as the origin, evolution, distribution, and fu future of life of, on Earth and in the universe. So today we're going to talk about a lot of things. I have like a million slides for you, so I'm going to try and whip through them really fast to give you kind of a Wikipedia knowledge on what astrobiology is and how we do it. So we're going to talk about habitability, life in the solar system, where, where's the best pl places to look, how we detect exoplanets, how we detect life, um, how we detect intelligent life, uh, and then there's going to be a little quiz at the end. And if there's time, I'll talk about some of the philanthropy work that I do with National Geographic. Okay, so space is really, 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 really big. And it's hard to think about these big questions like life in the universe without quite understanding the vastness of the universe. So I'm going to ask for audience participation again. Um, I want you to take a guess. Well, first, what are these blobs that are flying at your screen right now? Well, first of all, for audience participation, you can either chat or better yet, um, you can raise your hand. And the way to raise your hand to ask questions, um, I'm going to link it down below. Uh, one second, let me just grab it right now. Um, and that way, when you raise your hand, I will unmute you and you'll be able to ask your question. Right. Um, Okay, I just I just put the instructions in the chat box. Um, Julia, do you want to listen to a question right now, or do you want to talk some more? All right, so I could just uh, continue. Mainly, my question was, what do you think these blobs are flying at at you on the screen? Okay. But uh, I can just move on, and there'll be more time for questions at the end. Okay, um, maybe just think in your head, or if you want to, just type it in the chat. Um, so these are galaxies and I like to play this game when I do this talk for kids is like guess how many galaxies there are in the universe. So if you want you can take a guess on, in the chat um, and I'll wait a few moments. But there are about 400 billion galaxies in the universe and my next question for you all is how many stars do you think there are roughly in about each of those galaxies. So the number for that is about 400 billion stars, roughly in each galaxy. Of course, there's some that are small and some that are, are large, but roughly about that many. Um, so that's a lot of stars out there. And we are just, you know, one planet around one small star in one of these galaxies. And uh, we're trying to figure out if there are other stars that have uh, planets around them that could be suitable for life as we know it. So we live in a galaxy, this is not a picture of our galaxy, um, but it's kind of a similar galaxy. Our, our galaxy is a spiral or more of a barred spiral galaxy and we live kind of two thirds out in the center. So there's a whole lot of stars that we can't even see from our own backyard. And there's a whole slew of galaxies out there that are equally as massive and impressive um, as ours. So how do we even begin about uh, figuring out where life is in all of this mix? So first we have to think about, well, where can life live? We only have one data point of life and that is here on earth. So NASA defines habitability as the potential to have habitable environments that are hospitable to life. So you probably heard the term habitable zone before sometimes referred to as the Goldilocks zone. And that basically denotes um, where liquid water can be present around a, a planet around a star. So we have what we call a habitable zone here around our star. Our star is a small, a relatively small yellow star. It's actually called a yellow dwarf star. And we, our planet is luckily in this kind of 
a perfect zone where it's not too close to the sun, like Venus, where it's about 800 degrees on the surface and not too far away, like Mars, where it's a little bit too cold to have liquid water. Um, but the habitable zone is almost kind of a misnomer because there are other places in our solar system where you can have habitable conditions that aren't necessarily falling in this habitable zone. And we're gonna talk about that a little later. But wanted to point out that with larger stars, like some of these O-type stars up at the top, these larger, um, hotter stars, your habitable zone needs to be farther out. Otherwise you feel the heat because you're too close. And if you have a small, such as this M dwarf star down here at the bottom, um, you need to be closer to that star to feel the heat of your star to uh, have the right temperature for liquid water. So there's some problems with uh, the fringes here. Um, these larger, brighter stars tend to uh, live really fast lives. They're kind of, stars are kind of like dogs. Like big dogs, they, they eat a lot of food, um, but they have short lifespans compared to say a chihuahua. But if you're down at one of these chihuahua stars down here, you might think, oh cool, so that star is not gonna um, blow up or, or change for many, many billions of years. Um, but to be close enough to feel the heat of that star, you are, you're trapped in what we call tidally locked. So one face of your planet is always facing that star at one time. So that could have some interesting effects for habitability. It's not clear whether or not that is good or bad, um, but it, it, it maybe is not um, uh, Julia, your sound is cutting as out. If the water on Mars, um, I was saying my internet connection isn't yeah, stable. Yeah, really your internet was cutting out. So you're going to have to what, or just repeat what you said um, in the last minute. Okay. I was just saying last that this, this is the most graphy graph that I'm going to throw at you today. And we're going to be talking about um, why water on Mars is kind of a misnomer. So water exists in three states, solid, liquid, and vapor. Um, and just shout out again at me if my internet craps out again. Um, so not only do you need the right temperature to have liquid water, you also need pressure. So Earth has an atmosphere which creates pressure on our surface. So in order to have, be in this liquid phase here, you need an atmosphere. We have about one atmosphere, which is about 101 kilopascals. Um, um, but, but Mars is cooler. It's a little bit farther away from the sun, as we all know. But it also has about 1% of the atmosphere that Earth does. So it barely gets into this kind of liquid phase. Um, and you, it's very unlikely that even with warm temperatures, you would ever get um, enough pressure on the surface to have liquid water, it would just boil away or freeze out. Okay, so that makes sense. Most graphy graph I'll show you today. So I'm gonna kind of quickly go through kind of the, the places in our uh, solar system to look for life. So Kathy mentioned earlier, under the ice of Europa. So this is one of my favorite moons, it's the moon of Jupiter. Um, if you look at the surface up close, you can see it's this really cool, they call it the chaos terrain. It's these crisscrossy lines. I did this talk, um, a similar talk with, with kids the other day and they said it looked like spaghetti. So underneath the spaghetti surface, there's a reason why these lines uh, look like this. It's because there's something happening underneath to kind of create and melt and reshape the surface. So that means there's something active happening underneath. And uh, based on data from orbiters uh, passing around um, uh, this moon, uh, there are signs that there, there is an underwater, a sub-ice ocean that has the potential to have life. So all life on Earth as we know it needs to have liquid water, and here's another place that's not necessarily in the habitable zone that has liquid water. So we know here on Earth, even devoid of sunlight down in these hydrothermal sea vents, we see a whole ecosystem with, um, with life thriving 
even though it's not getting direct sunlight. So that's something to think about, something that NASA is looking at sending some missions to in the future. Another moon, um, this is Enceladus, which either autocorrects to Escalades or in Enchiladas, depending on what my word processor is doing. Um, this is another really cool icy moon. And in its south pole here, you'll see these kind of blue lines or spaghetti, as the kids say. Um, and coming out of these lines, these it's called the tiger stripe terrain. And coming out of them are these liquid water geysers. And um, because I often try and work with kids, I like to give them this moon a, a funny name called the PP moon, because it just looks like it's peeing in space. And I think it's funny. So right here, we see that there is something happening underneath the surface, perhaps something liquid, uh, a liquid water coming, coming out of this, uh, this small moon around Saturn. All right, so Mars, everyone's all hot about Mars. NASA seems to just keep wanting to send rovers there, which is super cool, and I get it. But a lot of us astrobiologists keep sharing this, this meme around because every year or so, there's some new discovery about water on Mars, and we're like, all right, it'd be hard to get water um, on the surface of Mars. Most likely, if there is water, it's going to be subsurface or locked up in. Um, a, a gas or in ice. Another place that used to be talked about a lot by people like Carl Sagan. Um, Judy, you're cutting out again. Venus. On the sky. How am I now? I can go reset my internet if that would help. I think, I think when you're close to the microphone, it's better. Yeah, so let's just try that. Okay. So here we have Venus, um, pretty hot temperatures, about 900 degrees Fahrenheit um, on the surface. Uh, but in its clouds, it's, it's not as hot. Um, although it does rain sulfuric acid on this planet, it, uh, science fiction writers and, and um, early astrobiologists like Carl Sagan used to kind of hypothesize that there might be life floating in the clouds, like floaters and sinkers and stuff. So it's a possibility, it's highly unlikely, but it is close enough to the habitable zone that um, it's probably one of the better places in our solar system to look. So uh, life beyond our solar system, we're gonna talk briefly about how we detect exoplanets. And there's a few different ways because if we're not gonna find life in our solar system, perhaps we can find life around another star. So this is a little outdated of a, uh, a slide, but as of today, I wrote it down somewhere, we have discovered 4,144 exoplanets in about the last 20 years. So when I was um, in elementary school, we had zero uh, exoplanets detected. So it's a pretty cool time to be uh, in, interested in astrobiology because our technology is just getting better and better. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's great. So how do we detect exoplanets? By looking really, really carefully. <laughs> so really the three ways we uh, detect them, the three main ways, and there are more others, is the radial velocity method, sometimes called the Doppler shift method, the transit method, and direct imaging. And I'm just gonna go over these pretty fast, um, cause I wanna, we have, I don't wanna take up, I wanna leave some room for questions at the end. Um, so the transit method, you might've heard of the Kepler mission, but basically there's a, star and the planet will go in front of the star. Julia, it's cutting out again. And block out a little bit of the starlight. Okay, I'm going to restart my internet really fast. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. I don't, I'm in the shared house, so sometimes it gets funky. 
one second. Um, talks amongst yourselves. I've just unmuted We're everybody, unmuted. so you guys can have a chat, and then when you're We're all it, unmuted. <laughs> does anyone does have any questions or any observations they want to share? Can't leave it. All right, um, I reset it, so hopefully that will be a little better. Okay, you're gonna, you're gonna have to go back to the last slide because no one heard what you were saying on that one. Oh, okay. Yeah, perfect. Okay, so the transit method is when a star, when a planet goes in front of the observer and the star, dimming the light of the star just a little bit. So I was using the example of a recent Venus transit. This was back in 2012. This is a picture of our star taken through a cell phone camera through a telescope. So if you imagine that the, um, our sun here is just, a, this is a picture, and you imagine all of the pixels that are making up this image, um, the planet Venus would take out, I don't know, a handful or so, depending on how high resolution your camera was. So we're looking for very, very small dips in the overall output of, of the starlight. You might also notice that there are these sunspots on the sun. Um, and these can also give kind of false uh, positive detections of exoplanets. Um, we have a way to kind of get around that where you have to make three accurate um, detections of an exoplanet. Um, am I still coming through? Okay. Yeah, it's working great now. Okay. I'm just going to text <laughs> my household just to see if they're using up any bandwidth. But just, while I'm doing that, take a look at this uh, GIF, or GIF, how we say it, um, of planets transiting in front of their stars and how that dips the brightness of the overall light. All right. Okay, so somebody asked in the chat, what are the dedicated astrobiology space missions? Um, so there were three space telescopes. Kepler, um, which recently kind of stopped working, was monitoring 145,000 stars. There's the Corot, the, which is a French, French space agency mission, which is this middle kind of picture here that was also looking for transits and tests the transiting exoplanet survey um, that's currently up monitoring 500,000 stars, including uh, 5,000 nearby kind of those small red M dwarfs. Um, one second. Okay, so those are these are pretty uh, dedicated missions, um, and from those we've discovered over 4,000 exoplanets. Another way you can use ground-based telescopes to measure the wobble of stars. So this little X here represents the Berry Center, kind of the, the focal point, if you remember like a, a seesaw, kind of the tug of war of the two masses in space. The stronger your tug is, is measured by how much mass you have. So of course, this, something like a star pulls a lot more on its planet but a planet still exerts some force on the star. So actually things in space are orbiting around a central point called the Berry Center. And we have enough technology to detect a small wobble of a star to pretty great precision. So the way this works, it's kind of like um, uh, a Doppler shift. I'm not sure if I actually shared my sound on this computer. Let me just do it. Let me just do an example really fast. Can everyone see me? Yes. Okay. I see you. 
Great. So I made this obnoxious Doppler shift ball that's going to make a really loud sound, kind of like a siren. Um, and I'm going to wobble it by whipping it around my head. And I want you to hear if you can hear the subtle change in the pitch. Did you all hear that? Yes, you did. That was great. Awesome. Cool. I wasn't sure how that was going to go over Zoom. Um, so that change in pitch is due to the change in uh, sound waves, uh, either approaching the microphone or going away from it. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen again. All right, I'm gonna share computer sound, but I'm gonna skip this video because you've all heard an ambulance passing you making that, that sound. Um, let's go. Okay, so the way this works is when like a car or ambulance or a police car is blaring out sound, when it's approaching the observer, the sound waves get compressed and actually change higher in pitch. And as that car is moving away from you, these sound waves are elongated um, stretching out the waves, and we call that, um, it, it changes sound in a lower pitch. So we have higher pitch and lower pitch. Um, in science, in astronomy, we call that blue shifted and red shifted when it's applied to light. So believe it or not, our, our star wobbles. It wobbles a ton. So this, if you can follow this, this little graph here, um, all of these dots are where, how much our star has wobbled. Um, over the years, due to, mainly due to the influence of Jupiter. So if there's an alien looking at our solar system, they would be able to detect a strong wobble from Jupiter. And if they have really good technology, maybe they could detect the influence of Earth, Venus, Mars, Saturn, etc. So a uh, little planet would have a very small wobble effect on its star. And that's what we are looking for. I see that Trent has a question. Um, what magnitude is that shift for our star? And so I'm not sure what you mean magnitude. Like the wobble that you plotted on the, on the sun over the years, what kind of like, how much does it move? Like 100 kilometers or? You know, I don't know the exact amount, but I do know that the, I've, I've been reading about what our Barry Center is, and I've been seeing some uh, somewhat conflicting uh, messages, but they, I think it's beyond the surface of the sun. So the Barry Center for our star is beyond the surface of the sun for Jupiter. Oh, gotcha. Thank you. Yeah. Or as in California, we'll just say, hella. <laughs> It's hella wobbling. All right, so here's another example. This is either like a, a little star in a big planet or this, you could kind of think of this as the orbit of Pluto and um, Charon, the moon of Pluto. So they, they orbit a, a more central point of gravity. In order to see the Doppler shift, the wobble of a star, you have to kind of be in the line of sight because if you're looking kind of face on, like if you're, say, if we're looking down on the solar system, you won't really see the star moving towards and away you. So you have to get really lucky in your orientation. So when we see the shift, we're, we're seeing a shift in what we call spectral lines. And I'm going to be talking a little bit more about spectral lines um, in some of these upcoming slides. But when we break down the light of a star with a prism and a spectrograph, uh, we can see these um, absorption features that are these black lines. And say if a star is burning hydrogen, we'll see them, we'll see the characteristic fingerprint of hydrogen, and we know what, what exact wavelength hydrogen should be um, absorbing at. Um, and we'll see that being shifted. And we know, we know that the star is burning hydrogen, but we'll see the wavelengths of the spectral lines shifted either red or towards the blue. And I see a question, why can't we see the shift of a star um, when looking from the top or the bottom? And that's because the star wouldn't really be moving towards you or away from you. It would be more moving um, 
kind of side to side. All right, does that make sense? I'll show you another um, GIF here. So here's what I mean with those spectral lines. You can see the star is now moving away from the observer and now it's moving towards the observer. So as it's moving towards the observer, um, the, the, the spectral lines are blue shifted um, and when they're moving away, it's red shifted. And that's due to the influence of a planet. Okay. All right, for direct imaging, Oh, I forgot I had a whole transit de planet demo. Or maybe I'll do that at the end. But for direct imaging, um, it's really tricky to actually take a picture of a, another planet around a star. The way we can do this um, is using ground-based optics and some fancy tricks, mainly by lasers. And I'll show you what I mean by that. Um, so this is some uh, technology called adaptive optics, and it's a whole lot of science that I don't fully understand. So I'm just going to throw out this, this science-y image and um, explain to you kind of what it's doing. So here, when we have a ground-based telescope, we are peering through the effects of our atmosphere, which can distort an image. And you can see um, this nebula on the right side coming into focus and being blurry. So if you have, it's like looking, you know, through like a, for something at the bottom of a pool, you have to look through all of that water that can um, kind of distort your image. But imagine you could remove the effects of the atmosphere and adaptive optics does just that. So we create artificial stars in the sky using these high powered lasers and that, um, dictates when we look at this artificial star that we've created, we can see what the, um, the distortion is of the atmosphere in real time. And then below the optics, the, the mirror of the telescope, I'm going to go back uh, an image here. We have these little um, kind of axles that will, will correct for what is happening in the sky in real time. So you're kind of artificially focusing the telescope based on the distortion of the atmosphere. And I think that's so cool. So that's adaptive optics. Um, there's also some kind of cool tricks you can do to kind of throw out the light from the central star. Um, and this is one of my all time favorite images. It's, uh, this is taken by um, some Berkeley researchers. Um, so you're taking out the light of the star and these are actual images of exoplanets orbiting around a star. And I, I'm just like blown away every time I see that. And I'm going to show you, let me see. Do, do, do. I meant to have a penny with me. Oh, I'll just use this, okay. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. I'm not sure this will work too well, but basically if I have a little planet, where's my little planet? You know, like pretty close to my star. It's gonna be really hard to see unless I block out the light. So that's basically what some adaptive optics are doing and um, some future telescopes are trying to do. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen again. Okay. Now I'm going to talk about some future space-based fancy telescopes that I think are going to be game changers in terms of imaging exoplanets. So hopefully all of you all have seen the Voyager image of the pale blue dot. This was taken by the Voyager spacecraft in the outer solar system when it turned its cameras back towards Earth and got this beautiful picture of Earth floating in a sunbeam. Um, and this is a historic photo and it's, you know, been quoted over and over again. Carl Sagan has a beautiful monologue about the pale blue dot. And why this is cool is that we, if we can see this in another, around another star, we can get information from the atmosphere of that planet. And, and I'll talk about that in just a little bit. But in order to do that, we have to have really large collecting area. 
So but what telescopes are are basically just photon buckets. And right now we have going on is the Hubble Space Telescope, which is about 2.4 meters in diameter. James Webb Space Telescope is about 6.5 meters in diameter, and it has not been launched yet. And the next class of telescopes that's being developed by the Goddard, NASA Goddard Space and Flight Center is the Louvoir mission that I think they just, um, it's kind of uh, in a proposal form right now. And that's gonna be much, much bigger. So this is a, a mission concept for the Louvoir Space Telescope. Um, and why that's cool is that there's two, this is, this is a little bit of a complicated image here, but if you can see on the left, there's a Louvoir A, which is 15 meters in diameter of the, the telescope, or in Louvoir B, which is nine meters. And um, the Hubble Space Telescope is down here at the bottom. And let's take a look all the way to the right at what Pluto looks like through the Hubble Space Telescope. It's a few kind of blurry pixels, not much information you can get out of it. Uh, with, when the James Webb Space Telescope launches, you'll be able to resolve uh, Pluto a little bit better, actually much better. Louvoir B at nine meters, even better, and Louvoir A at 15 meters pretty, pretty well. And the column here on the left is describing the types of exoplanets that these missions will be able to resolve. And, and of course, some cool astrophysical phenomena. So if we really want to image exoplanets, we need to put these, we need to fund and promote these large space telescopes um, that can get down to these pale blue dots so we can actually extract information from these atmospheres. So uh, there's some, some cool technologies that you can pair with these large telescopes called a uh, star shade. And right now there's an ongoing study between uh, what we call a coronagraph, which is this kind of um, just a circle that we use to block out the light of the sun to observe nearby comets versus um, a star shade, which is this flower-like shape that does a, a really good job of suppressing um, starlight. Sorry, my cat's getting all up in my business right now. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about this star shade technology um, before, now the mission is called HabX, but the, the star shade petals um, are defined by a hyper Gaussian physics equation that I like to, um, to use an analogy. It's like the, boy, the Bose noise canceling headphones. So basically the starlight is canceling itself out by diffracting over the, the petals, um, canceling its own light out, which allows the tiny faint light of the planets to be able to be captured by the telescope. So here's a pretty old school image of the starshade technology. So you fly this thing in space. The starshade is about 50 meters in diameter. And you fly, have to fly in alignment, your telescope in the shadow of your star shade. And once you do that, you're blocking out the light of the star and allowing the light from the planets into your telescope. And on the bottom image here is a simulation of what our solar system would look like through this technology. So you're blocking out the central light of the star and you see this fuzzy kind of halo. We call this exozodi, which is kind of, um, light scattered by the dust in our solar system. But then you see this beautiful uh, pale blue dot emerging, which is of course the earth. So if we see one of these pale blue dots in our, in our lifetimes, um, that would be a time to bust out the champagne for sure. And I just wanna show you how cool this technology is of this star shade. Um, NASA hired some origamists to help with the folding and kind of unfurling of this telescope or this, this uh, star shade, which I just think is so cool. And it's really tricky stuff. You have to be able to formation fly. And um, I don't know what the current state of this is, but I know that it's, it's quite tricky to do this and that, that there are dedicated scientists and engineers working on trying to make this uh, a feasible thing to launch. Okay, so once we have our starshade up there and we're seeing the light from the atmosphere, then what? Well, then we need to break down that light using rainbows. So kind of your basic principle of using a prism 
and going back to what we were chatting about with the absorption lines, uh, we want to see where those lines are because that can give us information about what molecules are in the atmosphere. So I was talking about hydrogen earlier. Um, so if you have a light source like a star um, and a cool gas like an atmosphere and you break it down with a, uh, a spectrograph, basically a fancy word for a prism, you can see what elements are in that atmosphere. And if this is making no sense to you, if you forgot that lesson in eighth grade physics, I'm gonna break it down a little bit more. So in this picture here, here's a, a image of our, our star's um, spectrum, basically. You have to send the light through a small slit and then put it through a uh, prism, or we call that diffraction grating. You don't need to remember these terms. I won't quiz you on them at the end. But hydrogen um, has a very distinct uh, absorption spectrum. And you can see these dips in the rainbow down here, and they correlate to different wavelengths. So when we see something like this, we are like, okay, we know it's burning hydrogen and perhaps some other smaller things in these smaller ab absorption features here. So what we want to see, so if you go back to here, you can see these dips. Basically, this graph here is a representation of the rainbow above, just graphed in terms of intensity over wavelength. So sorry if this is getting a little bit too in the weeds here, but I think this is super important. If we were to graph our atmosphere in the same way, you will see absorption features, those dips, you can imagine this is the rainbow here, um, of oxygen, a lot of water lines. Water is a, a very big absorber, some CO2, um, a little bit of ozone. And why that's important is well, this dip right here, oxygen. There's not a lot of good reasons why an atmosphere would have oxygen. You need, we have photosynthesis constantly replenishing oxygen. It's a, a highly, highly flammable um, gas. That's why we use it in rocket fuel. And it, it reduces with other um, elements and molecules pretty fast. So it it's, would be really interesting to see another um, exoplanet that has a similar oxygen feature to the, what we do. There are, of course, other ways you can make oxygen that's not coming from life, but we're looking for some sort of spectrum like this. So that would be, um, that would be a reason to bust the champagne out, not only getting the pale blue dot, but getting some really interesting features like oxygen or perhaps even methane. Okay, oh. Screen sharing has stopped, oh no. Um, can you all still see me? Yeah, we can still see you. Are you not able to share the screen again? No, I am. I think my PowerPoint just quit for some reason. Okay. Okay. I see some, uh, questions. I'll try and answer those while I recover my presentation. Yeah, I can read them out to you. Um, sure. so Peter's asking, could we also look for pollution for science of life? I love that question. Thanks, Peter. Yes. So, um, Recently, we had a, a SETI talk um, on Tuesday about some researchers that just recently got a grant for uh, modeling exoplanet, or excuse me, modeling atmospheric technosignatures. So things in atmospheres that could not be explained by natural phenomena. And I have a, a few slides at the end of this talk. I think we're back up here. Hold on. No, we're not. All right. Um, so I'll keep talking about that. And that's part of what I want to do with my, my research as well. Um, and then Mike is asking, are there other elements um, that, we're look, that we're on the lookout for and for similar reasons? That is reason similar to why we're looking for um, oxygen. Yes, great question. Um, so I mentioned a little bit before. Um, let's see, I'm going to share my screen again. Um, methane would be an interesting one. Uh, we know in early Earth's atmosphere, there was a peak in methane and little to, to no oxygen. That was before the rise of photosynthesis. Um, so methane, I did my master's thesis on, on methane, so I could talk your ear off about this funny molecule. Um, but it, 
it is produced by natural processes and by life. So seeing something like methane and oxygen at the same time would be super interesting because those two gases, um, they, re they react pretty fast. So you need some sort of constant flux pumping out these gases um, to be able to have them in an atmosphere. Great question. And there are other ones um, I'm not probably not as familiar with with them, um, but there's a few other really interesting ones and perhaps even some hazes. So we're gonna talk about aliens now, and I found these great gifts for you. So we're talking about you know detecting biosignatures, and most of this work is 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 more focused on detecting kind of non-intelligent life or non-technological life. But you know, with SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, uh, we're looking for signs of ET phoning home or ET phoning anyone. Um, so all of you probably have seen the movie Contact. This was a huge inspiration for me. And uh, we have a real life kind of uh, contact happening now with the Breakthrough Listen Labs and the Breakthrough Listen uh, team held at uh, Berkeley SETI Research Center, which is the group that I am a part of. And so SETI has had a tumultuous kind of history. It started about 60 years ago with up and down funding and um, amendments in, 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 uh, in bills saying NASA cannot fund SETI anymore. And mainly it's been funded through philanthropy in the last um, several decades, but uh, right now, I wanted to introduce you to the kind of bright side of all of this. The Breakthrough Listen team is really taking the lead in um, developing the world's most comprehensive SETI search to date, and it's a huge honor to be a part of this team. So when we think about the technology that humans give off, we obviously you've all seen the Sutro radio tower in San Francisco. That's a pretty large radio tower emitting high powerful um, radio waves that are detectable at a few at a few light years away and we have these really loud radio pulses that we do in the center picture here um, we have a planetary radar system because you know we don't want to end up like the dinosaurs so we need to make sure our local um, kind of asteroid neighborhood is is free of of asteroids because you know the dinosaurs did not have a space program and we don't wanna end up like them. So we gotta check out what's coming at us. Um, in order to do this, we kind of do these chirps, kind of like a bat doing echolocation or sonar or radar. And those chirps are really loud. And it's one of the loudest kind of emitters, the beacons that Earth sends off. Also, I was mentioning these lasers, the high powered lasers that we do, we use to create artificial stars in our telescopes. Um, some of these high powered lasers uh, if you're looking right at it, could potentially outshine the sun uh, by a few thousand times. So these are things that we know humans have developed. Perhaps these are things that other civilizations out there would also mimic or 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 use. So we're we're looking for signals above the noise in um, both radio and optical wavelengths. Some of the ways we do this are with some nearby telescopes and some telescopes far, far away. The Automated Planet Finder, which is um, by San Jose at Lick Observatory. We use about 10% of their time to look for these optical pulses. The Green Bank uh, Telescope in West Virginia. It was recently struck by lightning, but I think they are on, back on board observing now. Uh, we use about 20% of their time to, to dedicate to SETI searches, as well as the Parkes Telescope in Australia, about 20% of these times. So the, for, for reference, these two bottom telescopes are quite large. The Green Bank Telescope is the largest steerable structure in the world. It's over, um, it's bigger than uh, a football field. I think it's 300, oh, you know, I always forget how, how, <laughs> how big the diameter is, but it's bigger than the size of a football field. Um, we also have some partnerships that are happening as we speak right now with the listed um, telescopes that you see on the screen. For example, we, I think we just signed an MOU with the FAST telescope, which is a 500 meter aperture space telescope, or 500 meter, yeah, 500 meter telescope, which is kind of like the Arecibo telescope, but this one is in China. 
So um, for example, one day of the Breakthrough Wiston observing is equal to about one year of any previous search. And not only are we using more telescope time and bringing online new telescopes to do SETI observations, we are uh, including some, some cool technology like machine learning, AI, um, and something really cool called commensal observing where we're putting kind of our technology on the back ends of these telescopes and piggy banking, piggybacking off of existing research happening. Um, basically to get that, get some of their data and, and scan through it without any harm to the existing observations going on at the time. All right, so we are running short on time, but I just wanna say thank you so much. Um, I might take about one minute to go through some of the philanthropy things that I'm involved in, but if you wanna stay in touch, here are the deets. And I'll also email everybody um, with this information. Great. Along with the Zoom link. Oh yeah, I forgot about the quiz. We'll, we'll stop here and do the quiz. Okay. Okay. And for the quiz, um, raise, uh, actually for this quiz, you can actually type your answers in the chat box. Um, and then when we open up to Q&A, um, we'll just have, we already have like probably, you know, five, or ten, we can extend it to 10 minutes of the Q&A and then we'll do the raise your hand um, option oh. for that. Great. Okay. Well, hopefully you didn't see that uh, <laughs> first question, but um, all right. First question, what is one way to detect exoplanets? Transits, yeah. Great. Oh, awesome, the flower-shaped petal thing. Yeah, we call that a star shade, but nice. <laughs> Awesome, yeah, those are two ways. There's a few others. Let's see if anyone can get it. Make sure everyone's still awake after that laborious lecture. <laughs> Radial velocity. Excellent, the, the wobble method. Yep. There's one more. Um, actually, no, I think you guys got them all. The transit, the direct observation, exactly. Great, nice work. A plus. Okay, how many exoplanets have we discovered to date? And I will even take something, yeah, close enough. Four, over 4,000, 4,100. See if anyone gets it. <laughs> I love this. Okay, uh, 1,000, or excuse me, 4,144. Okay, name and describe a future exoplanet detection technology. So I'll, if I'll refresh your memory, um, some future fancy telescope names. The James Webb, the Starshade, the Sunshade, yep. And there was one more that has a French sounding name that I wanted you all to remember. Louvoir, woohoo, nice work. Okay, what are the black lines called in a spectrum? I didn't pause on this, but I said it a few times, and this is, if you remember, eighth grade spectroscopy absorption lines. Perfect, nice work, killing it. Okay, what's my least favorable, favorite habitable planet and why? <laughs> Definitely Mars, nice, Julia, <laughs> and so over it, um, yeah. I think it's great that NASA's sending stuff there. It'd be really great if they, if we sent life detection missions there, because let's just figure it out already, in my opinion. Okay, all right, so uh, talk to you for a few minutes about the Ad Astra Academy. This is uh, some work that's been funded by National Geographic, as well as the American Geophysical Union, um, which is an initiative under the Blue Marble Space um, Organization. So the Ad Astra Academy um, is my way of kind of giving back. Um, and its tagline is inspiring underserved students to discover opportunities through science and exploration. So we have a website down here. And uh, we started it in 2015 by my, my colleague, Dr. Jeff Marlowe. And basically what we do is we bring a team of international scientists and we work with local partners. We only go to places that uh, we've been asked to come or invited. 
And what we really try and do is spark uh, the students' curiosity to, to think critically and think like a scientist, to really give them that intrinsic motivation to, um, to carry on science and carry on education. Um, we've been to Bangladesh, Nigeria, Rio de Janeiro, and Oakland. And uh, it's not ultimately, we don't need them all to be scientists, but we really just want to empower them to be like, hey, I can do science, I can think critically, and I, I can achieve my career of my choice. So it's a really fun, they're week-long workshops, they're very hands-on, inquiry-based um, exploration-based uh, workshops where we take them on field trips and we do a lot of observations and do some hands-on experiments. And that, that was fast, wasn't it? Um, I think this is my last, my last slide. And I wanna say thanks so much, Canopy, for hosting me and thanks to my organizations to sponsor all of this work. And uh, I will open it up for questions and I appreciate you all taking the time out of your day to, to join me. Yeah, that's great. So if anyone has any questions, uh, go ahead and raise your hand. I put the instructions again um, in the chat. Looks like Marianne's had her hand up for a while. So I'm gonna unmute her and you can go ahead and ask your question. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I don't even remember what my question was. That was the beginning of the, the, the presentation. So I'm sure that uh, it was addressed during the presentation, but thank you. Okay, no worries. Well, we've got um, Peter, so let me unmute you. Hey, um, thanks for the talk. Um, so my quick question was like, can we use the same methods for like looking for exoplanets to look for like the moons of these exoplanets? Like we have the whole wobble thing. Can we like look at the wobble of the exoplanets and maybe look for like the moon? I don't know why we look for the moon. I just thought it'd be cool. But uh, yeah, anyone working on this or like any ideas? Wow, that's a great, that's a great question. Um, I assume once we get our technology, uh, once we get our technology down, I don't see why we can't look at an exoplanet to monitor its wobble. Um, I imagine it would be very small. So we have to have, really precise measurements to do that. There is uh, some folks talking about looking for exomoons in some of this like transit method uh, data with the test team and with the Kepler data. Um, I don't think any exomoons have been found to date. I could be wrong, I'm not an expert on that. But I know that they found interesting signals such as exocomets, which are pretty cool. Cool, thanks. Um, any other questions? I stumped him. Oh, there I, we go. I've got one actually. Oh, uh, hold on. Julia. Julia. Hi. Oh, okay, who's there right now? Mike, go for yeah. it. Uh, I was totally fa that star shade is pretty fascinating. Yeah, that thing. <laughs> so. Uh, maybe I just missed it. How far away is it from the telescope? Like, how much? I'm wondering how much it's just doing physical blocking versus that interference blocking that you were talking about. You know, if it's really far away, then just if it was just a disk, maybe the telescope wouldn't even notice it. Like, it wouldn't even matter. Um, but since it's got this weird pattern and fringe on it, it's creating that interference pattern to block the light. So yeah, I just wonder if you had any more to tell us about that. Yeah, so I worked on a prototype of this mission in like 2007. So my memory is a little rusty on the exact details, but I remember it was like, you know, like I think like 50,000 meters away from the telescope. Okay. So pretty significantly far away. And that will depend on the aperture of your telescope and the uh, diameter of your starshade. Um, so those, I think there's a, few, there's a few studies happening now trying to determine, you know, if we do launch a Louvoir, which, which, which diameter of the Louvoir telescope are we going to launch? Therefore, you know, what size um, star shade do we need? And then how far away does that need to be? Um, but with the problem with just a simple disk like that is the diffraction around the edge of that disk would be significant enough to muddle the image where you couldn't get the light or enough contrast from those, the, the faint light of the reflected uh, planets. Very cool. Thanks. Hey, you're welcome. Uh, we have Julia that's up next. So aliens, have there been any documented contact whatsoever 
officially no as far as i'm aware and as far as uh we're all aware um the the most interesting one actually i have a few things to say about this the most interesting one was uh, i always forget the date i think it was in the 70s the wow signal and i th- i believe there's a documentary out there that's recently released i'll just type it in wow signal and it has an exclamation point um that was this like high powered pulse and we've looked in the same area over and over. There's been no kind of confirmation or follow up. So it's this one anomalous signal that we have um, of something really interesting. So, oh, I, I just sent that to somebody privately. Okay, well, wow signal with an exclamation point. <laughs> um, that being said, um, with the Breakthrough Listen, with, with the, the data that we collect, we collect petabytes of data. We have servers full of of SETI data that we we can't analyze in real time all the time. Sometimes it backs up a little bit. So there could very well be a, a signal in our servers, like a needle in a haystack just waiting to be discovered. So, so officially no, but you never know. Okay, we have uh, Julia Michaels who has the next question. Hi there, great talk. Um, I just had a question about the machine learning techniques you were talking about. Just seems like it would be a really amazing opportunity to expand your ability to to look for um, signs of life when you are using the um, the capacity of the satellites that you have access to. And like, I didn't really have like, is that like a big impact on the ability of, of SETI to look for life or is that kind of still um, in the works in terms of, um, you know, just something that you'd like to do in the future? Or is that being put into practice now? Yeah. So I think a few of my colleagues are working on machine learning. It's not something that I'm working on. It's like, seems like French to me. Um, so I'll, I'll comment on what I know about it is that we are, we are implementing some machine learning algorithms from what I'm aware of. Um, and What's cool about that is, you know, we are looking for what we know. We're also looking for any sort of signal above the noise, but there could be some really interesting things in there that we might just be missing from the way we're analyzing the data. So by using things like machine learning, that will help us kind of sift or sieve through those, those things um, with kind of, I don't know, with more of an agnostic approach, but in terms of the exact, um, machine learning, sweet programming skills, I'm, I remain ignorant. <laughs> so do I, I just it seemed like a, um, a really cool technology that could be applied to what you guys are doing. So. Totally, yeah, and that's definitely in the works. And I think um, we might have just hired, a real, we had a recent search for, I think, postdocs that were supposed to be uh, doing some of that stuff. Neat. Yeah, cool stuff, huh? That's great. So we have Artarsh that's next. Hold on, I'm, I'm on YouTube. Oh, wait, hold on. Uh, there we go. Artarsh, you can go ahead and ask a question now. Hi, thanks. Uh, first of all, I really enjoyed your presentation and I found it very informative. And in fact, one thing I have been working on recently, so I'm very interested in machine learning and space exploration, by the way. Let me just share my screen. So one other telescope I just, just like to share about is the Aero Space Telescope. So this telescope is very similar to some of the uh, ones you've mentioned in your presentation, except that this one, instead of just measuring the dip in light or the transit curves in one frequency, it looks at them in 55 different wavelengths. So it's able to find the dip in light when the planet passes in front of the star in 55 different wavelengths. And this actually allows it to detect what are the different components in the exoplanet's atmosphere. And I had been working on a project about this of using machine learning to remove the effects of star spots on these observations. That is so cool. I have not, uh, can you type the name of that telescope in the chat? Cause I, sure. Cool. Oh, very cool. I think I see the link here. Cool. I will definitely check that out. I'm going to copy that right now. I had yeah. not heard I'm of a, that. I'm a graded student from Toronto. Cool. Nice to meet you. Okay. So we have, we'll take one last question uh, from Trent. He put it in the chat. 
What's your thoughts on the Fermi paradox, specifically how common life should be in the, in the universe? Mm, yeah, this one keeps me up at night. Um, I recently read the Three Body Problem book, and that. So the if you I don't want to spoil any of that book. It's pretty good, but there's this kind of theory called the dark forest, where um, basically the theory is if you're out alone in a dark forest, you don't want to turn on your light because you would expose kind of your location for potential predators. So you could apply that to how like detectable aliens might be because maybe nobody wants to be discovered for, you know, a variety of reasons. Like you don't want the bad aliens coming to take all of your resources. Um, but, you know, statistically it's improbable for, for one star to have one planet that has life around it. I think it's statistically improbable, but we're trying to, to prove that that's not the case. Um, but another a thing to think about the Fermi paradox um, is, is perhaps we're missing um, the right timing. Perhaps there is a civilization that happened 5 billion years ago on a, a planet far, far away. And it's, it's lifetime. It, it's uh, the lifetime of that civilization has ended before we're even uh, equipped to detect it. So there's all of these these questions, not only of if it exists, but when it exists. And are we uh, existing at the same time to be able to detect each other? Because remember, um, we've only been sending out radio waves for about 100 years. So we've only been detectable for about 100 years. And you know, the whole evolution of the universe is 13.7 billion years old. So there's just a lot of room for, for error and you know, ships in the night to happen. So gosh, yeah. We could be the first. I've heard that as a theory. Um, maybe we're the only ones, but I, I think it's unlikely. But you know, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, and until we find another, then uh, we can't really say much about it. But it does keep me up at night. Thank you so much, Julia. Well, we're going to have to wrap up now, and that was. Such a fun talk. I love having you guys uh, do events with us and you'll be doing a lot more with uh, National Geographic. Um, I'll be sending an email out to everybody tomorrow um, that sent it through Eventbrite with the Zoom link and uh, Julie will send me all of her donation links. Um, and yeah, it'll be great to like, support in our projects and, and come see more of our events. Um, if you sign up over um, our, our newsletter, um, that's where you see everything. Um, and yeah, we hope to see you again soon. Thank you so much. All right. Bye, everybody.